Let's go ahead and sing all day long. I've been with Jesus. Are you excited about Jesus? Amen. Let's sing it unto Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. Well, all day long I've been with Jesus. It has been a wonderful You may be seated. Believe in God for good things. We have a great time. We have had a great time, and amen, God continues to be real. Amen. want to welcome each and every one. Remember, amen, that uh, uh, we'll take, uh, we have uh, Pastor Roland Perez preaching, and then Pastor Andy Anderson. And then we have the favorite, amen, the coffee and donuts, amen. 1030, amen, so you'll be encouraged, amen, believing God for good things. So God is a good God, God is a merciful. So let's give Pastor Roland come uh, a, well, a warm welcome as he comes and ministers this morning. Chest, chest, chest. Praise God. God is good in this place this morning. Can you say amen? And uh, amen, it's great, great to be in conference I've been stirred, great preaching. Uh, how many appreciate last night's sermon? I got everybody like on the alert. And I want to tell you what a great honor uh, it is for me just to simply bring the word of God this morning, beloved, to this conference body. Uh, I consider it a great privilege again to be behind this pulpit. And uh, thank God for you. And I'll tell our church, man, thank God that you made it to conference. And listen, we appreciate 
all that effort that was done on your part. And so give yourselves a round of applause on that this morning. It's not conference without the conference body. And I want to thank my mother church here in San Antonio, beloved. Uh, listen, amen, what a great example. And so thank God for that. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 2 John 1, 1 through 8, and verse 13. I certainly thank my pastor for this opportunity. My prayer is just to bring something to the table this morning. 2 John 1, 1 through 8, and verse 13. I read about a place called the Sing Sing Correctional Facility. It was a maximum security prison in New York since 1826. In fact, it was one of the first prisons in that area that the prisoners actually had to make the prison, if you will. And they were out there breaking rock every day to basically make their own cells. It, it was known as a harsh, harsh uh, prison, uh, difficult conditions, 19th, 20th centuries, uh, some of the uh, issues there took place, uh, and uh, many times the prisoners there were flogged. There was solitary confinement, the electric chair, watering was done there, torture, if you will. Uh, some folks wore iron cages where they had to walk around and they couldn't sleep. So it was really a horrible place. But some things happened and changed in 1921. Louis Laws became the director or the warden at the Sing Sing prison. When he retired 20 years later, actually they, they saw that prison as a great prison system to, you know, copy that, you know what, you guys did a great humanitarian sort of uh, uh, thing here. We want to try to use that, utilize that. We actually did see prisoners change, transformed, become productive citizens of society. How did you do that? You did a great job. And he said these words. He said simply, you know what? All that transformation, I owe it all to my wonderful wife, Catherine, who is buried outside the prison walls. Catherine Laws. And we have that first slide was a young mom with three small children when her husband became the warden and everybody warned her from the beginning that she should never set foot in that prison. Never go in that prison, uh, uh, Catherine. You don't want to do that. And so uh, the first prison basketball game was held uh, and she walks in that prison uh, with her three children. Sits right there in the bleachers uh, and just begins to look at the game. Everybody's looking at her like, lady, you're crazy. But she had this idea, and she simply said this. Her attitude was, my husband and I are going to take care of these men, and I believe they will take care of me. I don't have to worry. In fact, she insisted on getting acquainted with these men, their records. Uh, there was a convicted murderer that was blind. She went to visit this man, held his hand, and asked him the question, do you read Braille? He's like, what's Braille? Catherine Laws began to teach this man Braille. Another man was deaf, and uh, she learned how to do sign language uh, to then basically help this man with sign language. And that's what she did. She went from inmate to inmate to help these men in that place. Somebody said this. Many said Catherine Laws was a body of Jesus that came alive again in Sing Sing prison from 1921 to 1937. Tragically, in 1937, Catherine Laws was killed in a car accident. The next morning, Louis Laws didn't come to work, so the acting warden took his place, and it seemed instantly that the prison knew something's wrong. And I read this. Tim Kimmel writes this, the following day her body was resting in a casket in her home three quarters of a mile from the prison. As the acting warden took his early morning walk, he was shocked to see a large crowd of the toughest, hardest looking criminals gather like a herd of animals at the main gate. He came closer and noted tears of grief and sadness. 
He knew how much he loved Catherine. He turned and faced the men. And he said, all right, men, you can go. Just be sure and check in tonight. Then he opened the gate. Without a guard, a parade of criminals walked out three quarters of a mile to stand in line to pay their final respects to Catherine Laws. And every one of them checked back in, every one of them. Now, I read this story, beloved, and I thought of my mother church. Because if we're honest with ourselves this morning, how many of you know, listen, uh, we were prisoners not of sin, sin, but of sin, sin. And thank God that Jesus Christ saved us, uh, and he set the captives free. And it may be, in fact, uh, in a group like this, you might have been in prison, and that's, you know, thank God you're here today, though. <laughs> but I thought about that. Thank God that Jesus set the captives free. But I want to tell you, beloved, uh, if you are a convert, uh, a disciple of this church, uh, the Door Christian Fellowship Church here in San Antonio, or maybe you have another mother church, but listen, you got saved here or there, you came in, served God here, uh, you're a daughter church, uh, then more than likely what you have learned from Christianity uh, and actually how to live as a Christian, uh, you learned it at church. Amen. You weren't reformed, you were transformed uh, by the blood of Jesus. Can you say amen this morning? And through exampleship, you were taught, learned, uh, listen, uh, saw all this from a mother church, uh, the love of Jesus. Uh, listen, and I'm here to tell you as a witness uh, that this former prisoner, uh, I wasn't in prison, but prison to my sins, was befriended here, welcomed here, loved here, placed in this household. And if you've come in, beloved, uh, listen, amen, uh, it's not a coincidence uh, that you're here uh, in church today uh, or in this fellowship. This is why Psalm 68, 6 says, uh, God sets the solitary, those alone uh, in families. It's some of the best family members, friends uh, that you have, listen, uh, if we're honest with ourselves, uh, may not actually be our really real blood families. It's people in church. We're going to observe this morning the Apostle John's second epistle as he's writing to the elect lady and her children. Or we can best understand it as a mother church and her daughter churches. And I want to look at the attributes from this mother church uh, and its application for us today that we can glean, uh, listen, uh, from this mother church in the Bible uh, and my aim this morning is to be very practical, beloved, because we've gleaned from this mother church as well. And as a pastor being sent out years ago, listen, uh, it's good to know, now, what was mom's recipe on this? How do you make pan de polvo? <laughs> right? And apply that to where you're at. I want to preach a sermon I've entitled, The Elect Lady. And I think we have a slide on that, The Elect Lady. Second John 1, 1 through 8. The Bible says this, the elder, to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. Verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Verse 6, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world we do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Look at verse 13. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. 
God, I thank you for the word of God. I pray, God, this morning, God, for the anointing, God, for your direction, God. God, help your churches, God. Help, God, your church today. I plead the blood of Jesus, God. God, move my, God, in our hearts, God, uh, God, to understand what the Spirit would tell us this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. The elect lady. I'm going to look, first of all, at the background of this text. John is writing. Here's the apostle John. He writes to the elect lady whom I love. So here's the apostle writing to the elect lady or a mother church. And he's like, you know what? I remember your hospitality, how much grace you've given me, your faith, your consistency in walking in the truth. In other words, here John has a special place uh, in his heart for this local church and her children. And he adds, in fact, that not only he loves that church, but all those that have known the truth. How many can say, listen, beloved, that you and I have been coming, listen, to conference for years uh, We're here this morning because, listen, uh, we love the truth. Uh, We love the Word of God. You've come, uh, amen, to hear the Bible being preached. And therefore, listen, you love the elect lady, the mother church that is able, listen, year after year uh, to be able to, listen, uh, disperse, if you will, to hand out, give out, uh, listen, uh, some good meals, some great meals that we can say, Man, I learned something there, amen. Uh, So all those that have known the truth love that truth. Barnes comments, it is possible that a family still be extensively known as one of order, peace, and religion so that all who know of them or hear of them shall regard it with interest, respect, and love. In a word, this elect lady had a great testimony, a great reputation, So there's lessons for us this morning out of this text. Let's define the word elect for a little bit. It comes from a word, eclectos. Think about this. Eclectos, E-K, ek, if you want to use that word, means out of. And the other word is actually, lectos is legos. I'm not sure we get the legos toy, but that might be a connection there. Because the word means, Legos means to pick and gather. Or God basically got many Lego parts, uh, you and I, to build something this morning. That's why 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And the church this morning, we have a beautiful building this morning, beloved. But the church this morning uh, is not the building, the church is you. You're the living stones. You're the Lego part, if you will. Talk about a building project. And the word elect designates one picked out from the larger group for special service or privileges. What a great honor. What a great privilege that we can be here this morning uh, at conference because the Bible says this in Matthew twenty two fourteen, many are called or invited, few are chosen. Not just for conference, obviously, for salvation. How many understand that? But here's this uh, uh, definition of elect. And the themes of the letter include a warning, truth, and love. Let's look first at the warning to this elect lady. John writes basically this, dear, beware of deceivers or people with false doctrine wanting to corrupt good people in your church. Sometimes we have people coming into our churches, right, from other churches, recently had somebody do that. Wanted to give a word to all these folks until I caught wind of that. Uh, Somebody said, Pastor, this guy's giving me words, giving words to everybody. I'm like, what? Finally, you know, he he would take off. 
slippery kind of guy. I couldn't get a hold of him. I finally called him. I said, uh, sir, I said, listen, man. I said, I've heard this and this. You, you cannot come into our church just and do that. He called me a Pharisee, a whitewashed tomb. <laughs> I'm like, whatever, man. I don't know you from a hole in the wall. You have no authority here. Uh, listen, you know what? Uh, the prophet is subject to the prophet. So stop doing what you're doing. I, that's it. I'm out of that place. Good. Bye-bye. Sorry. <laughs> pastor Greg Mitchell said the pastor is a gatekeeper of the church. That not everything and anything that calls itself Christian can just walk in and come in. You're like, whoa, stop. You know. Not that we're checking, you know, your IDs and... But John says in 2 John 1, 7, which, why not? For many deceivers have gone into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. The word antichrist literally means anti-truth or it comes against truth. Apparently apostate teachers with false doctrine had tried to influence the church. Titus faced this problem in Crete. Timothy in Ephesus. Remember, during this time, most church meetings really did not take place in a building. Uh, churches met in homes. This is around 90 AD. This is a time of much of the uh, uh, persecution of Rome. It's called the Domitian Persecution. We've heard of stories like from Nero where they would use uh, Christians uh, as uh, torches, uh, human torches, put tar on them, light them up uh, uh, for their parties. Uh, and along that, uh, uh, you didn't have, uh, what do they call those things, the tiki torch things? You had people there. So these Christians met in different places and homes, uh, even during this time in underground tombs. This is why Romans 16.5 says, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. In other words, the devil wants to invade the house. Talk about a home invasion. Warren Worsby writes, As goes the home, so goes the church and the nation. Thus, the mother church or home church is an important target in Satan's war against truth. It's open for assaults, beloved. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I recall when the laughing revival was going around. In Christian circles, 1995, something like 4 million people gravitated to this false doctrine. I remember Pastor Wayman Mitchell preaching against it and simply saying, this isn't God. <laughs> this isn't God. Right there in a conference. Pastor Ruby preached on it, showed a, a, a video. Back then we had VCRs. I remember we were in the Imperial Boulevard building, uh, and it's called the Spirit of the Serpent or something like that. And so you had people, you know, praying for people, and then uh, this lady starts barking. I don't know. And then there's people going like snakes. They're like moving around like snakes. And other people are in the, in the seas laughing and falling on their floor, man. I mean, it freaked us out. So you had dogs, hyenas, and snakes. It sounds like a zoo. It not, you know, they got filled, right, with, they got filled with devils. And I have to admit, man, like, when we saw that, we're like, we want no part of that. And thank God, pastor preached against that false doctrine. He say Amen. I like what Pastor Gordon said the other night, mom protects her young. We've been well protected. I'm reading about artificial intelligence. Have you heard about that? AI? It's basically computer information at another level. June 16, 2023, the World Economic Forum, WEF, announced that it is working on a project to rewrite the Bible. The WEF claims that the current Bible is, quote, outdated, no longer relevant to the needs of the modern world. 
They believe that a new Bible written by artificial intelligence or AI will be more inclusive and welcoming to people of all faiths. That just happened in June. And this past June, AI actually preached its first sermon in a Protestant church in Germany. It had 300 people. It'd be like looking over here, but I'm AI somehow, you know, like a big tube. Good morning, everybody. You know, Four avatars preached, and the message they preached was on not fearing death. I'm like, wait a minute, you guys are avatars, you're not even alive. <laughs> but people are gravitating towards this. There's even counseling now that you can get, don't get though, but they're counseling through uh, AI uh, uh, for the Christians. Uh, they can simply type in there, you know, uh, problems with suicide and all the answers right there. But understand, they're tweaking it to the Antichrist. It's not truth. Jesus told his disciples in Mark 13, 22, for false Christ and false prophets shall rise and show signs and wonders uh, to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Again, why is this imperative? Because 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, the Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, the time before the rapture, Again, I so appreciated Pastor Stephen's sermon last night. Here at this, if you could, a little bit to that. Right before the rapture, it says, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Can you say LGBTQ+, plus, uh, woke, uh, and all that other foolishness? You can go in Austin. Drive downtown. What used to be a Christian churches now have the rainbow flags on them. I think somebody told me that there was some protesting going on in front of the Capitol or something like that, uh, you know, for Hamas, pro-Hamas, anti-Israel yesterday. I'll tell you right there, Austin is a blue dot in a red state. We're seeing all kinds of things. Elon Musk buying all kinds of things in Tesla, thousands and thousands and thousands of acres. I mean, it goes on and on. Here's my point. Fact is, if we don't embrace what mom has taught us, we will embrace other things. Did your mom ever tell you, put that gum down, don't pick that gum and chew it up? <laughs> Little kids, you know, pick up the gum and put that down. Secondly, I want to look at the selfless example of a mother church or the instruction to her children. What needs to happen here? Because if you and I are to keep our homes, our local churches, true to Jesus, then we must have the same characteristics that this elect lady displays in the Bible. Adam Clark comments, the work of God was prospering in the place where she lived, and also in her household. Or in other words, what a great example. Wouldn't you want to glean uh, from a great example? Wouldn't you want to glean, uh, listen, uh, from our church here uh, in San Antonio to say, you know what, this is what they do, this is what they've done, therefore we should do that as well. Did I hear an amen this morning? Paul said, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. In other words, what a great example. Listen, beloved, it will save your ministry. Don't have the Frank Sinatra spirit, Elvis Presley spirit. I did it my way. No, don't do it your way. I'm going to try this. It doesn't say you can't try new things or whatever, but I'm saying, listen, keep to the pattern and what we've done. Therefore, there's several things to consider regarding the characteristics displayed by the elect lady that we as daughter churches must exhibit as well. Number one, the elect lady teaches her children to walk in truth. Verse four, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth 
as we received commandment from the Father. It's a commandment, not a suggestion. Walk in truth. You know this word walk is a metaphor? It literally means the way in which an individual lives or conducts his or her life. And that only signifies to advance with a steady step, but with a moderate pace until one walks rapidly in it. Or you can picture a toddler uh, beginning to walk, right, kind of wobbly, then they get a little older and they start walking upright. The same thing for a new convert, young Christian uh, to a more mature Christian. At some point, you ought to be walking upright. At some point, you ought to know the difference. You've been taught right. You've been taught well. You've been taught truth. They walk in truth. John 8, 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Are you walking in truth? Therefore, you should be set free. John 17, 17, sanctify them or separate them in the truth. Your word is truth. Apply the word of God, and therefore you apply truth. You know, it was in my mother church, I was able to clearly hear and apply God's word. Live it. As I had been instructed, heard the gospel being preached uh, by pastor, amen, I saw brethren living it out. I'm making can say that's encouraging. You know, I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley. My mom was a beautician, one of the first Mexican-American beauticians there in Harlingen, 1950s or whatever, you know. I told our church the other day, we'd have, you know, these Cadillacs, uh, Lincolns pulling up, uh, uh, no offense, but Caucasian ladies would come out, get their blue tint, you know what I mean? <laughs> Gray hair. And because of that, my mom said, would you see these women? You say, good afternoon, ma'am, how you doing? <laughs> I'd have to, you know, she'd tell me, you better do that. Don't, don't act crazy. <laughs> We've got to keep our customers. So I learned that. She goes, oh, Connie, what a, what a nice young man. Because we've been taught right is my point. So the example of a mother or mother church gives us an appreciation of the one who teaches her children well. She teaches them truth with the hope that her children apply that truth. Billy Graham, in Seven Lessons I Learned from My Mother, writes this. He said, you know what I learned from my mom? Number one, there is dignity in hard work. Work hard, son. Two, a mother's prayers are powerful. Three, spend time in God's word every day. Four, start reading at a young age. And can I... Give a suggestion, uh, get off of social media, read more books. Five, marriage is worth fighting for. Six, even the best parents make mistakes. And seven, finish well. Billy Graham wrote, the influence of a mother uh, upon the lives of her children cannot be measured. They know and absorb uh, her example and attitudes uh, when it comes to questions of honesty, temperance, kindness, and industry. Let me just say, God bless God-fearing moms. See, Paul mentions Timothy's grandmother Lois and mother Eunice. Timothy had been struggling in his faith. He's afraid. He's timid. His father was Greek. In other words, uh, never came to salvation. Basically raised by the mom and the grandma, a timid kind of guy. Some things are going down. Paul, Paul's arrested. Maybe he's afraid because like, man, this is kind of radical. If I'm going to be radical like Paul, I'm going to get arrested. I don't want to get arrested. This Christian thing is getting too crazy. Making stance is getting a little crazy. Do I have any witnesses this morning? When you first got saved in your family. Mom, I got saved today. What? <laughs> But listen, it says right here, Timothy had been doing this, but Paul helps him at 2 Timothy 1.5. He says this, Paul does, listen, 
When I call to remembrance a genuine faith or truth uh, that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Or in other words, you've been taught right. Paul finds comfort as he remembers, you know what, these ladies' influence on this young man's life. You've been taught right. You've been deposited the right things in your life. Uh, listen, Timothy, listen, I know uh, what's taking place, but listen, uh, grab those things you've been taught. Because 2 Timothy 2, 2 and 15 says, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly divide the word of truth. The Bible, uh, the word literally means cutting straight. Uh, thank God this morning uh, that listen, uh, our pastors, uh, amen, Pastor Ruby, cut straight. If you can say, man, that's, that's a good meal. You know, I learned how to pray in my mother church. I saw Pastor Ruby praying. I saw my right there, you know, crisscross by the wall. <laughs> you know, I can't do that. I can't. I can sit in the chair maybe on the kneel or something. But for years, man, the pastor's right there. I said, you know what? What a great example. Yeah. Then I went to Prescott. The first time I went there, uh, there was a, 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 a tent there, blue uh, stripe and white, uh, and I heard a roar coming from that tent. I walked in there. People are getting a hold of God, man. It was like a roar of prayer. Amen. I learned to, to evangelize here. Street preaching with Ray Fallon and the disciples on Military Drive. First time I got a bullhorn, man, I, you know, Ray's like, okay, preach. Well, I'm like, the cars are like, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm like, this is it's kind of dumb. I'm, you know, <laughs> nobody listening, Ray. Just preach. I'm like, okay. <laughs> we went to a street preach after rock concerts with Les Snodgrass. I remember when, when Les is there, it was after a Striper concert. <laughs> They're like, no, they're Christian. I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> and we're preaching, man. Somebody threw a rock and hit Les in the head. <sighs> he started bleeding. I'm like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> like a martyr or something out there. <laughs> Going to Fiesta, the cops showing up. Pastor Ruby preaching there. He's pleading our case uh, right there. Uh, he's trying to get permission to preach out there. While there's drunks around, around him, you know, the cops are giving pastor a hard time. I'm like, hey, there's drunks around you, man. Listen, Pastor Mitchell would say, draw a crowd and preach to them. Pastor Greg Mitchell is still taking the land, uh, writes, it became clear that our call is to take the gospel beyond the four walls. He say amen. Beyond the four walls of the church rather than just sitting in the church building and hoping that sinners somehow will come. This is why Jesus said in Luke 14, 23, and the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. We've got to outreach. In Austin right there, we go to a, a crowded mall. They can't go anywhere. It's an intersection right there. Uh, and we put speakers right there. We got rappers right there in the corner. And listen, man, uh, we take dominion right there. We work with the Austin Transitional Center, Brother Mile, Hernandez, Chris Adenogy, other people going there. Diana Ibada, other, other folks, and there, there are men and women there that have come out of prison, uh, and we brought some of those to church as well. I can go on, but I was challenged to give here. My tithes, my offerings, to give to world evangelism. Can you say Amen. Malachi says, test me now in this. I was tested uh, right here in this church. We were inspired to give. It wasn't like, you know, if you want to give, uh, there's a, you know, a basket in the back, and, uh, you know, we don't want to pressure anybody. So if you feel led by the Lord, <laughs> listen, how many of you know that's not, kind of, that's not the kind of preaching we have? 
man, this is sword. It comes in uh, and it challenges us. Couples getting sent out. Oh, amen. Church planting, world evangelism. Acts 13, 3, then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away, being sent out by the Holy Spirit. Thank God for that, amen. John and Amy Rents were launched into Austin, Texas, uh, around 88, uh, 1989. They, listen, man, they broke ground there. They pioneered there. God bless the Rents, amen. And Barry and Mary Lou Parker continued that. And around 1990, uh, hard work, casted seed, uh, much fruit came. Uh, uh, there was a harvest during that time uh, in Austin. Young people coming out, getting saved. Thank God for that, beloved. The result of that, some 33 years later, there's folks still in our church because of that time. Amen. Let's praise God for that. For the last 12 years, my wife and I, my wife Liz, we've been there, have, to, have had the great honor, privilege of watering that great congregation right there in Austin. Uh, and today we have eight churches out, three of which are in the missionary field. And praise God for that, beloved. Because we've been taught, right, that at Bible conferences, as daughter churches, we are to launch out couples. Psalm 86, 11 says, teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Colossians 2, 6 through 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Number two, very quickly. The elect lady loves her children and wants them to show this love to others. Verse 5, and now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. But look at verse 6. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. You've been taught right, therefore apply it. Be not only hearers of the word, but doers. Otherwise, you're deceiving yourselves. Listen, thank God, beloved. If we could be here this morning. Listen, you know what, what brought me into the door, obviously, God, listen, helped and brought me in, man. I heard the word of God. It was 1989, I came in to a Texas rally. The building was on Zarzamora. I heard about him. A guy named Mike Neville was preaching that night. And I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And I went back to Waco, and it was on, man. <laughs> I'm going to a Baptist church back then. There was no door there. Pastor's like, Roland, just stay saved. Go to that nice church across the street. I'm like, okay. But I would drive over here, uh, listen, on Sundays, all the way from Waco, listen, uh, uh, to hear great preaching. And, uh, <laughs> but God didn't raise no dummy. Uh, I liked a young lady named Liz Rodriguez, okay. Hi, <laughs> right, Sister Liz. I, <laughs> I'd say it. Like Joe Sanchez's apartment, you know what I mean? <laughs> right there, you can see right there, his sofa's all destroyed. But anyways. <laughs> the Andersons. You know, listen, man, I want to say simply, as all that took place, beloved, I'll never forget, man, coming in, Pastor Ruby, Yolanda, many dear brethren, some of which had graduated, gone to be with Jesus. They simply welcomed me in. I'll never forget that, man. They came in and welcomed me and said, you know what? They befriended me. I told uh, Pastor Anderson, you know, I'll never forget, Andy, when you, uh, I first started coming to church, and I don't, I'm sure Heather had a lot to do with it, but I got uh, a birthday card from Andy. I'm not even in the church, man. Hey, Roland, just happy birthdays. I want to say it's a great seeing you coming out to church. 
Thank God for that. Galatians 2, 9. James, Cephas, and John, those who esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas a right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. The New Learning Translation says they encouraged us. Or the word pillar simply means a, a properly firm support. Or when we speak of pillars in a church, beloved, we're speaking about those that have a testimony, influence, authority. They support it, yes, financially, uh, and yes, display Jesus' love to others. God's love is held up in that place. Can you say amen? They call that agape love. It's a charitable love. Not necessarily a deserving love, it's charitable. How many know we found real love through Jesus, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And at church, listen, that love is displayed through people. Uh, this is my commandment, John 15, 12 says, that you love one another as I have loved you. So therefore, listen, here is Jesus, if you will. In the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word was God. The Word was with God. Then it became basically flesh to Christ. And Christ now lives in you. The truth, the Word of God lives in us now. And now we can display his love towards others. That's how it works. That's how it would attract people, like God's love attracts people, amen. Not a fake one, uh, listen, but a genuine one. That's how churches grow. And when that happened, man, listen, I, greatest day, listen, got married to my wife, became part of this church. Thank God for that. This relationship it's covenant-based. It's proven. The last thing is this. Walk in unity. Verse 13, the children of your elect sister greet you. Now we hear that word unity, like, what does that mean? But think of this. This is the children of your sister, elect sister greets you. John's writing the letter. <laughs> I'm not sure if somebody said, hey, tell them hi for me. Yeah, tell them hi, John. Okay. Or in other words, sister, right? You have the lick lady, she has a sister, she has kids, cousins. All right. There's a lot of cousins in here this morning. Man. This is why the Bible says this, beloved. In Psalm 133, 1 through 2, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down the beard, uh, the beard of Aaron running down the edge of his garments. Blessings come from top to bottom. Uh, or they extend, listen, uh, thank God for that. Can you say amen? There's people, beloved, listen, that bless you in church. And also, listen, Adam Clark says unity, according to the scripture, is a good thing and pleasant, especially amongst brethren, members of the same family. How many here are part of the Christian Fellowship Ministries, the Potter's House, uh, or the door, amen, uh, through Pastor Mitchell, through Pastor Warner? Listen, amen, lots of cousins, uh, over 3,400 cousins. Let's praise God for that. I got guys calling me, hey, pastor, can you send an invasion team? Sure. Right. Or some visiting pastor sometimes uh, from, uh, listen, uh, the branch uh, of the fellowship, if you will, come in uh, from other states, uh, and they say this. Uh, and I told our church the other night, they're like, man, we felt love here. We felt welcomed here. Uh, thank you, pastor, for that. And listen, man, that's what we do, right? Amen. Pastor Ruby once said this, our churches are built on the backs of other churches. This is what we believe in. That as daughter church, as we've been taught by our mother church, selfless exampleship, year after year, invasion team after invasion team, to serve and lend a helping hand, not to build our own kingdom, but to build his kingdom. Right. Right. I end with this story, Catherine Laws. The Sing Sing inmates called her Mother Laws. They... 
panned a birthday card. We might have a picture of that. They colored it and all that. Looks very nice. And sure, the inmates say this simply on this card. Our birthday thoughts to you. Since we have known you, we can say you've brightened many a lonely day. You've given from your friendly store a thousand joys we lacked before. And we shall always be in debt unto that happy day we met. Signed the Mutual Welfare League uh, inmate Joseph Mallow, February 27th, 1936. And all these simply wrote and said thank you to Mother Laws. And I want to say this morning, thank you to our mother church from Austin. We appreciate you. Thank you, Pastor Ruby Yolanda. We love you. Thank you for everything you taught us. Amen. Pastor Anderson. Hallelujah. Thank God for that, and uh, thank you so much for being here this morning. And I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Titus, chapter 1. Titus, chapter 1. If you've been driving on the roads of San Antonio in the last few days, and a car has been headed directly towards you, um, that was not someone playing chicken. That was me driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> Still trying to figure it out. It's wonderful to be back, and uh, uh, we really do appreciate everybody has been so kind um, in welcoming, welcoming us back, and I uh, really do believe that God is going to help us. Titus chapter 1. Um, Missionary work is an incredible adventure, and my wife and I have just returned from uh, either directly or indirectly nationalizing four churches in South Africa. The first church that we pioneered in Gugaletu, that church transitioned, was nationalized uh, six, seven years ago, and uh, we were... Uh, played a part in helping that transition. We planted a church out of the Port Elizabeth congregation into Francistown, Botswana. Botswana's a nation directly north of uh, South Africa. Uh, we saw that through all the way to nationalizing that. There's a tremendous young couple that's taking that church forward. There is a church in South Africa in the Eastern Cape, the province where we were at that was, uh, they had a mission church there. They were not able to leave a couple there when they brought their missionaries home. We put a couple in there. That church has gone forward and has planted churches. Now, we recently just nationalized uh, the Port Elizabeth congregation. We were there for 11 and a half years. My wife and I have been in South Africa for going on 21 years. We've spent a third of our lives in South Africa. And so... I feel I have some things to say about missionary work. I know that uh, from the San Antonio family, uh, South Side, uh, we've been planting churches in clusters in Asia, in Central America, and many of those churches are kind of on the early uh, side of the curve of that. And where I'm coming from this morning is I want to talk about nationalizing churches. I want to talk to sending pastors, some things that you might be wanting to consider, missionaries that you have churches established, you're beginning to plant churches, or you're getting to that stage uh, where uh, the indigenous church is an issue. I want to talk to congregations about the incredible digni uh, dignity that you have in sending missions. And so... Uh, 
just bear with me this morning. I want to preach a sermon called Nationalizing Churches. Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking. And appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination... For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, standing fast, or excuse me, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So I want to look first of all with you at the indigenous church. Uh, there's an excellent book that I think that every missionary should read. It's called The Indigenous Church by uh, Melvin Hobbs. And it talks about groups of churches that were moving towards being nationalized in South America. Uh, has some very good things to say. And this is the term, the indigenous church, because this is the goal of missions. And that is that a national pastor takes that church. In 2000, uh, we had just opened our church in Gugaletu. Pastor Mitchell came for the missionaries in South Africa. Some came from north in the, in the uh, continent to be a part of that. And one of the first uh, statements that Pastor Mitchell made in the Pioneer Shepherd Seminar was, you're here to work yourself out of a job. And that struck me like a ton of bricks because I had pioneered and pastored a church, taken that to full-time ministry, and realized that this is a different viewpoint. Every pastor understands that at some point they might leave and move on and take over another church or pioneer another church, but there's something about nationalizing a church where you realize that you're putting everything in them with the distinct possibility that there will not be another pastor sent there. They are going to be it. And so your input and your viewpoint is a little bit different. And the goal of any credible missions movement is the indigenous church. By definition, indigenous means living or occurring natively. We heard the terms indigenous people, or the indigenous church. This is when a missionary nationalizes a church. It is taken over by a citizen of that country uh, who is a part of that church. This is happening everywhere in our fellowship around the world. We've successfully nationalized many nations that are now pastored by national pastors. This is happening very quickly in South Africa, there's five missionaries left in the midst of, I believe, 80-something churches there. And so we're tracking in that direction. The marks of an indigenous church are basically four things. They are self-supporting financially. They are self-propagating, meaning that they run themselves without having to be told what to do, have their hands held, or... Uh, being directed by an outside force, they are self-governing, which means they can solve their own problems and situations. They have a structure that is in place. And then they also are self-theologizing. And yes, that is an actual word. And that's very, very important because what that means is that the national has been able to absorb the teaching and embrace the doctrine of the Bible, of the pattern of a fellowship, and they're able to bring that into with their own insight and understanding of how to disciple themselves. They're self-theologizing, and this is very, very important. In South Africa, John G. Lake, who went to South Africa in the early 1900s, established in five years several hundred churches, would roll over in his grave if he saw the churches there today, because they've been reclaimed by culture. The Methodist church is a cult today in South Africa. And so God forbid that that would happen anywhere in any nation where we have a missions movement is that these things must be in place. They are self-supporting. A church is not a church until it supports itself. 
And it's not your church until you support it with your tithes. It is self-propagating. These are the things that are very, very important and must be in place in any church, and this is true here in America. But this is the goal is to export that into the nations of the earth and to see that there is a reflection of that all over planet earth. And the vast majority of our churches and our fellowship are in other nations. There is a term called syncretism. By definition, that word means a combination of different forms of belief or practice. And this is, this is in the third world. This is in Asia, this is in Africa, where uh, people will be evangelized. You can preach the gospel to them. You can even see conversions. But alongside of that, they will live out their culture. In India, Jesus is just another one of 300 million gods. It's very common in places where real conversion and discipleship has not laid hold, where people will turn the church back just into their regular religious idolatry thing. It just has a potter's house sign on it. Was encountering somebody witnessing they're from a Christian church. We were mentioning food and he said, no, we do not eat pork. This is in South Africa. We do not eat pork. And I'm like, bring the bacon. Why not? <laughs> and they said, well, Jesus cast a legion of demons out of the gathering demoniac into a flock, or in, into a herd of, of pigs. And so that means that if you eat pork, you'll become demon possessed. This was a foreman, former mission movement church member. And so this is the goal. It's one thing to plant a church. It's another thing to have a lasting legacy of sound doctrine. And this is the work of the missionary. See, I don't think we really can appreciate just how different the United States is compared with the rest of the world. The United States is the only nation whose society and culture is founded on the Bible. And that's absolutely being challenged in our day and age, but you go to the, especially to the third world, and it is a completely different realm. The mindset is completely different. The worldview is completely different. So therefore, the task of the missionary is to deal with the cultural strongholds that are there. And there's a point in time, missionary, where you begin to view your congregation and evaluate your disciples as, will they do that after I'm gone? Will they hold fast to that? Will they do that without me having to tell them three times a day? Will they be self-starters? Will they have the initiative? And what we're looking at here in our text is the task of Titus, who is a well-tested son of Paul. He's actually called, Paul calls him a true son earlier here in this chapter. And Titus is a very interesting, powerful disciple. Titus was present at the Jerusalem council. And so just back up a little bit. Paul's reaching Gentiles. The Gentiles are being reached. There's a dilemma now. Judaizers want to make Gentile converts Jews. And so Paul had two sons that he mentions, Timothy and Titus. Paul circumcised Timothy to give him access to the Jewish synagogues where he was evangelizing. Timothy would not have been, had been accepted there. And so he circumcised and brought him there, and he did that, but he did not circumcise Titus. And as this tension between Jewish and Christian convert and legalism began to take hold, this became a leadership issue, and it was brought to the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, and Titus was there. Paul brought Titus there as exhibit one, and saying, you go ahead, you question this, you examine this man's faith, and it was enough to convince them that they did not have to have circumcision be a part of the Christian culture. And that was because of Titus' testimony and his faith and his ability to convince and teach and demonstrate that he had a spiritual DNA in him from his father, Paul. 
Titus was sent to Corinth. And so Timothy had been sent there. And we all know about the church in Corinth. Corinth was a challenge to pastor. Corinth was known, it was a great church, but Corinth had issues of immorality, tribalism. They were crazy at communion. They were weird on the resurrection of the dead. They had disruptive church services. And so Titus was there. He pastored that church for a while. And then down the road, Paul sends Titus to Crete. Titus had a skill set. He was able to go in and bring order and solve problems. Verse 5, for this reason, here in our text, verse 5, for this reason I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So there's a twofold mandate for Titus the national. Set in order and appoint orders, appoint elders. For what purpose? Verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, so that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. So this is what is present in the churches and the culture in Crete. I need you to set some things in order. Verses 10 and 11, there are those... There are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcisions whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Elders were put in place, national pastors were put in place to preserve the Christian culture established by the missionary in the face of the national ungodly culture that would threaten to take it back. This is the task of nationalizing churches. Is having the right national pastors who are worth their salt, who can ensure that there is a legacy that is handed. Titus was tasked with going after the culture issues in Crete. Missionary, this is what you're looking for in your disciples. You're looking for men who have an unction and will not easily be intimidated. So I want to talk to you secondly about overcoming intimidation. Because in a mission setting, especially in the third world, there is an assumption about the missionary. They pick up on your accent. If you're an American, they smell money. In the third world, you come in, you are always the outsider. We were missionaries in two different churches for a total of almost 21 years. There was always a little bit of an element, you are not one of us. That's not an insult, that's just the reality. Towards the end, there was a church that gave us South African names, and I did check the translation, they were not insults. You know, there's a novelty or celebrity status about the missionary. If someone sent them, there's money. Missionary, don't flash money. You make a huge mistake if you do that. You just be discreet. You be discreet in how you you dress, how you carry yourself. You will attract all kinds of attention for all of the wrong reasons. You will attract thieves. You will attract people who will come and attach themselves to your ministry for the totally wrong reasons because they smell money. You're going to be dealing many times with false motives. There's another issue that is part of the third world mindset, and that is a mistrust of authority. And what this comes with is this is part of the poverty spirit, the curse of poverty, A poverty mentality. Part of a poverty spirit is a mistrust of authority. Popo is here. A mistrust of authority. 
Because they have never learned biblical authority, it's difficult for them to trust. And what you will typically find in the third world, doesn't matter if it's Asia, Africa, South America, you will find people who, those who are in authority, especially their boss, they will not be honest with them. They will not tell them the truth, they will tell them what they think they want to hear. They will also translate that into a relationship with their pastor. It doesn't mean they're wicked people, that's just how they've been raised, that's how they've been trained, that is their mindset. And so they might speak English, but they don't speak American English. And there's all kinds of things that are lost in translation. I had to learn very, very early on, especially with disciples grooming to be pastors, give them specific instructions, tell them what to do, and then say, okay, what are you going to do? Have them say something completely different from what I just said. I said, no, that's not what I said. I said, I want you to do this because there's communication is two-way. And there's so much dysfunction in the third world. It doesn't, it's not an insult, that's just a reality. It's part of the curse. There's a dysfunction of communication that is there. They don't listen to what you say. They listen to what they think you're saying, what they think you mean. And then they respond by what they think you want to hear. So did you go ahead and do it? Did you get that thing that I... Yes, Pastor. Show me the receipt. Pastor. No, I'm going to do it. Well, you just said that you did it. And you have to learn how to communicate with that. This is everywhere, because I preached on six continents. And it's everywhere. And this is part of the disciple, the pastor-disciple forming relationship is the communication and connection issue. And it's, you have to work through that because one of the tentacles of poverty is the fear and the avoidance of the blessing that comes with authority relationships. You have to work through that. Poverty deems relationships as capital that is to be leveraged. When people don't have money, when they don't have capital possessions, relationships are their capital. I will do something for you out of this relationship, and now because I've done that, you owe me, and I'm going to hold that as leveraged against you. Very, most commonly in, in society, in, in the entire continent of Africa, people will not, uh, at, at work, there's corruption and there's theft Workers will not out their co-workers or say, that's not right, you're stealing, you can't. They will not do that because, they will not out them because they know that someday I'm going to need you if I get in trouble with the boss. That filters into the church. That kind of a mentality filters into the church. This is why many times the pastor will absolutely be the last one to know about fornication, about adultery, about rebellion, because they will not. It is viewed as uh, betrayal to tell the pastor about cultural sin. And this flies in the face of a very powerful element in the church, and that is the element of the church judging itself when it comes to sin. See, the pastor shouldn't always have to be the bad guy. Part of poverty, part of the third world mindset is an unwillingness to confront. And so missionary, you're working through all this. This is, this is an element that you have to sew into the fabric and the culture of your church. And that is the principle that the body judges itself. This is true biologically. If you eat something that you shouldn't, the body judges itself. If you pick up a virus, the body judges itself. That's what a fever is all about. 
because fevers can only, or viruses can only live at a certain body temperature, and so the f- body temperature rises, kills it, it passes from the body. This element is true also with the church. Some specific things that you'll find in foreign cultures that are strongholds that must be addressed and redeemed within the church, and that is the issue of family as idolatry. Matthew 12, Jesus is preaching, verses 46 through 50, while he was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brother stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, here are my mothers and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and or is my brother and sister and mother. And so here's Jesus' blood family, at least part of his blood. He's ministering. He's doing the will of God. His family is outside of that building. They're outside of the will of God, and they're calling him to come outside of what he's doing. Unsaved family will always be pulling on converts. We experience this here in the United States, but this is something very, very powerful working in the third world and in the foreign field because there isn't much else besides family. And relationships are capital. And so drop everything. Don't go to church, drop everything. Mama calls or there's a family meeting or whatever happens in your nation where that is, and that has to be broken through. People would disappear. You know, South Africa was once a British colony, so there's kind of a British model there. December 15th till January 15th, Christmas holidays, everything shuts down. You can't get flyers printed. You can't get anything done. Everybody leaves. Many of them backslide. Beginning of the year, you're just trying to reel them back in. You say, hey, how you doing, man? We missed you. We missed you. Said, yeah, I was on holiday. Well, where did you go? I didn't go anywhere. <laughs> well, we haven't seen you in church, but I'm past pasta. I'm on holiday. We don't take a holiday from Jesus. <laughs> pasta? They look at me like I'm on mushrooms. No, you're on mushrooms. You have to work through that. You have to work through the issue of money. Pastor, money is a dominion issue. Sending pastor, you should consider that your missionary candidate should be very good with money. He should have money dominion. That couple, that family, they should be able to have demonstrated to a degree that they have the ability to save, that they're not squirrely with money, that they perhaps have a testimony of having solved by themselves a financial setback and gotten back up on their feet. Because guess what? If they have been able to do that, they will put that into their, mission, into their nationals. And if you're the sending sponsoring financial church, you're going to want that. You're going to want to have that kind of an element where there is a money dominion there. And our, both of the churches that we pastored, our door director or our assistant pastor, uh, because they don't have this kind of a training or background in their, uh, in their bringing up in school or with family, I would just give the brother a, a, a petty cash account. Petty cash to buy toilet paper and petrol and gasoline and things like that and an accounting sheet so they could start to learn how to be financially accountable because they're going to have to demonstrate that. They had to approve themselves in that. You know, we were in, again, we were in South Africa for a long, long, long time. Uh, We took over the church in Port Elizabeth in 2012 There was finances there. 
There's so much finances that I talked to Pastor Ruby and I said, ethically, I do not feel right about receiving as much of a salary from the Mother Church as we are. Our congregation could do this. And in 2014, we sat down with our church council and that's exactly what happened. We reduced our salary from the Mother Church. And the church in Port Elizabeth began to pay our salary or part of our salary, the equivalent of what was drawn back. A couple things happened. Number one, immediately there was a dignity that came on that church because it supported a pastor. Secondly, it began to put in place a budget habit of being to be able to prepare that for the national pastor who has recently taken over so that he does not have to work. You want to try to leave your church financially in a place where the pastor can live by the gospel because if he has to work he's not going to it's going to affect the type of disciples that he makes there's going to be something that is stunted in that church and so that pastor that we have left there he is supported by the church his wife does not work a job need to move real quick. (laughs) We established a savings. We planted a church into Botswana. We supported that church financially for eight years. We had to pay the, the pastor a salary. We had to pay for the building until it got off of support. It's nationalized. No more support, thank God. One of the things, church planter, if you're going to consider planting a mission church, you're going to have to realize you are locked in for a significant financial investment for the long term. And there will be surprises. And most of them will be unpleasant. (laughs) We established a savings. We left that church... with over 200,000 US dollars. And yes, I am still a signatory on that bank account. (laughs) Because that church is gonna one day buy a building with cash. You have to put this into the culture of the church, something that is very, very important the church must be self-governing, which means it, the body judges itself. This was an issue. The classic example is immorality in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 5, 2, and 3, and you are proud. You should have been filled with sadness so that the man who did this should be put out of the group. I am not there with you in person, but I am with you in spirit. I've already judged the man who did that sin as if I were really there. Speaks about the danger of leaven and how that pollutes the church. There must be a dominion in the church, a healthy church culture. There has to be this dominion of cleanness, otherwise you'll have little deposits, little footholds of immorality and or rebellion. We had to deal with the rebellion the last three years that we were there. That's why it took us so long to get here, because I was not going to leave that church with rebels there. And one of the things that we did, again, sowing into the body this principle of judging itself. And we dealt with rebels from the day we got off of the plane. And in working through that, began to bring this back to the disciples. Pastor, he's doing this and this. Well, he's your friend. Why aren't you sorting them out? You sort them out. Matthew 18. You, and we began to do this. And so we had a rebel. This man actually thought that he was going to take over the church and push me out. And we've got 10 churches. He wanted the money. And he came back in. He'd been in the field. He came back in and he's immediately hitting us up for money. He's complaining. He's writing letters. And I sat down. I had our council with him. I had our council sitting there with him. Our council gave him a beat down. And I I said, that is fabulous. (laughs) That is not common 
in the third world. And when that happened and I watched that, I said, you know what? This church is tracking in the right direction. Because the great fear, we would have people come, Pastor, you can't leave. You can't leave. We're afraid of national lighting, of what, what people will do. What, what people, if, if they would do this to a missionary, what would they do to one of their own? You know, David was anointed in the midst of his brethren. And they're, not too long after that, his brethren treated him with contempt at the battlefield of Goliath. And this is the dynamic of raising up a successor where someone begins to take on the mantle of leadership and express that. And so we had to, I had to create platforms where this successor could step into places and earn credibility, and he did that. And you know, let me say this, many, many times in our fellowship, we have, um, uh, we nationalize churches out of crisis, or we do them in short notice, that's just the nature of it. The missionary gets a call, hey, we need you to nationalize it. I need you to get, you need to get back here. I got a church for you to take over or whatever it is. But what was unique about this experience is it is easier to nationalize a church when it has fewer daughter churches than when it has more. Because that national is not just pastoring that church, he's pastoring pastors. And we understand this here. We see this here in the United States. It is a different animal in the third world. And so we had a great luxury, and I'm so grateful that we had the opportunity to take time to groom our assistant for actually over three years and prepare him. And as he stepped into this, he is absolutely ready for it. A couple of things I'm going to close. Missionary, sending pastor, there needs to be an administrative responsibility that that national develops. Especially if he's taking over multiple churches. He's going to have to wear that cap. I know, uh, you know, he must prepare a successor for this aspect. There's a couple of books that you might pick up. One's called... Uh, Successful Succession by Gary Tracy. There's another book called uh, Transition Plan by Bob Russell. Uh, both of these things are in place. You're going to have to do some admin stuff. I was locked in admin purgatory. <laughs> Making sure the church is properly registered. Making sure that you're linked properly with the tax revenue services within that country, that all has to be lined out. It has to be put in place. Because see, as, as I was doing this, and we had built up our war chest of savings, and I'm going, I was talking with our bank account manager, and she was looking at, you know, our annual statements from the accountants and all that, and she said, you got a lot of savings, what are you going to do with that? And I said, we want to buy a building. And she said, well, let me look at something. And she came back the next day and she said, because of your savings and because of your consistent profit loss on your, on your uh, account financials, you are pre-approved for mortgage. That does not happen in South Africa. I didn't fill out an application. I didn't fill out an application. I didn't, I didn't offer my children. I didn't have to be personal guarantor because I'm an American. Man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. You have to consider this as you're preparing for this. It's been mentioned before, pastor is the gatekeeper. That pastor has to have the moral courage to hold fast to the Bible and not be intimidated. Amen. He is the gatekeeper. Acts 20, 28 through 31, Paul is leaving Ephesus and he says, therefore take heed to yourselves to all the flock among, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. 
Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch. This is the concern of Jesus, is that he, the, the pastor, he writes letters to the churches in Asia. He writes to Pergamos and Thyatira. He says, I have this against you because you allow this in your church. Missionary, you have to put this into your men. You have to test them in this area. You have to help them recover. We had a great luxury of uh, this assistant that we groomed who took over the church. He helped us redirect a pastor. It's one thing to plant a church. It's another to redirect and have them process through to get back out into into the field. Um, One thing real quick about culture. An indicator of real conversion is that men will expose the uncleanness of their culture. They will do that willingly. If they're dodgy about that, if they're not real clear, if they play, if they act ignorant, you're looking at an opportunist. And you need to be careful of that. See, the answer to all this is not programs, but spiritual sons. 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. See, people who really love God and get it as to those who we really are, they want nationals to succeed. We made the announcement in El Dorado Park last month and came back in the Sunday morning. Our church knew about it you know, viral YouTube. And I'm coming in just to greet people and I'm wondering, okay, what's the reaction going to be? And I came in through the door before the service started in between Sunday school and the service. I went to a couple men. I just went up to greet them. Two of them shook my head, Pastor, well done. That was incredible. I was... um, conflicted as to whether or not to show this video. Uh, and so we're going to go ahead and put this up. This was the announcement at the end of the Bible conference in uh, El Dorado Park. They'd already announced all the new churches, and then they announced that we were nationalizing. And so this is the announcement that they made when they announced that we were nationalizing. I've got Easter. I want to ask Andy and Heather just to stand where they are. I want to recognize them. That's not a tribute to us. That's a tribute to San Antonio. That's a tribute to Pastor Ruby and his patience. That's a tribute to the congregations that have given to world evangelism through the years. That's a tribute to the mother church. And so in the Navy, there are things called carrier strike groups. These are ships that are, the flagship are aircraft carriers. They have escorts, destroyers, and other warships, and they travel in groups. There's There's a carrier strike group that's moving towards the Mediterranean right now. There is a carrier strike group in South Africa that is partnering together to plant churches and reaching outside of the continent of Africa. South Africa last year planted a church from South Africa all the way up into Ethiopia. 
Our fellowship in South Africa is positioned now in regions to partner together financially and with experienced pastors to touch Asia, the rest of the continent of Africa, and other nations. There is a carrier group in South Africa that was sent there by San Antonio. Pastor, that's what you can do, and that's what we can be a part of. God bless you. Let's welcome our brother. Stand. Let's go ahead and stand this, this morning. Now, what a powerful preaching. Amen. Praise God. If that doesn't move you, you're dead. Amen. <laughs> God is good. God is merciful. Just real quick, no exit on this door. Everybody goes through the side, go back, amen, to the donut place. No food or drinks in the sanctuary, please. Amen. What a beautiful place. Let's keep it that way, right? Amen. God is a good God. Amen. We'll have Brother Dan... Kanaj, amen. Uh, pray, pray over the food this, this, uh, 